Hey guys, welcome to The Remnant Radio. You're watching one of 19 episodes with Dr. Craig Keener, one of the preeminent Bible scholars on the planet, and we're talking about the Gospel of Mark. This is going to be an exciting episode. The connections that Dr. Keener put together while we were with him at Asbury Seminary, phenomenal. But man, it was an expensive trip to get all of us out there to film this content. But we want to give it to you for free. Well, we do want to give it to you for free, but... One of the ways that you can help offset the cost for this is by purchasing our home group material. Dawson, our researcher, has put together this material. There's a leader's guide. There is a participant's guide. So you you watch the video, you read the material, and then we walk you through. We have discussion questions that go along with it. It could be a huge blessing for you and your church. Yeah, and this would be perfect for tons of different mediums. Maybe you're a pastor uh, who's preaching through the Gospel of Mark, a home group leader, a Sunday school teacher. Uh, this would fit all of your needs. And if you want to pick this up, there's a link in the description for the home group material. In addition to that, maybe you're out there and you don't lead any kind of group like like that. Uh, maybe you just want to contribute as a thank you to what we've put together here on Remnant. There's PayPal descriptions in the link of this video if you would like to uh, support us. So absolutely, click those links in the description, hit that subscribe button, and please enjoy this video with Dr. Craig Keener. We just did an introduction. Uh, we swapped out co-hosts, got uh, Roundtree out of here, and got Miller That's to replace move. him. It was, it was a wise move. move to get into chapter one. Uh, so no, we're, we're, we're diving into the subject today, talking about chapter one. Uh, first thing, uh, Jesus, he's the son of God. Uh, this is uh, often said, this is the meta narrative of the, the big part of, of the gospel of Mark. We talked about that in the introduction, uh, but, but in the very beginning, it talks about the gospel. Uh, explain to us the meaning of gospel of the son of God and how we're to understand that phrase. <clears throat> it's interesting that Mark frames his introduction by talking about the gospel. Mm -hmm. So the beginning of the, of the good news, the gospel of Jesus Christ, the Son of God, verse 1. And then in verses 14 and 15, he also speaks of announcing good news and speaks of the good news of the kingdom. <clears throat> and sometimes people want to drive a wedge between the good news of the kingdom and the good news about Jesus, the Son of God. But as Son of God, Jesus is the good news of the kingdom. Amen. He's the king in the kingdom. I mean, the kingdom kingdom means God's reign. And so uh, the good news of the kingdom is the good news about Jesus, but it's, it's a mystery, the kingdom mystery in the first part of the gospel because people aren't ready to understand too much. I mean, once they find out, once the elite find out that Jesus is a messianic figure, then he's competition, he's rivalry. Uh, so they want to they want to do him in. So it was wise for him to be discreet at the beginning. Mm. He riddles them, he teases them, <laughs> but um, but also the good news. That uh, expression was commonly used in Greek, but it was normally used in the plural, just like we say good news in English. But in the New Testament it's used always in the singular because there's one good news, mm -hmm. one good news, I guess we could say, maybe uh, the good news about, about Jesus. In Greek, you know, heralds after games could bring good news, so-and-so won. Uh, it could be used to hail the emperor's birthday. There's an inscription that speaks of the beginning of good news in terms of the beginning of, of Augustus's uh, reign or his, his uh, birthday. But it's also used in the Septuagint, the, the Greek version of the Old Testament, where you have it a number of times in Isaiah. So he's going to quote from Isaiah chapter 40, verse 3, in verse 3 of Mark 1, uh, letting you know, think Isaiah in context. But in verse 8 of that same chapter, it speaks of good news hmm. to, to Zion. And then in 52, 7 of Isaiah, he, he says, he speaks of the good news of peace, the good news of salvation, th if those ring a bell from the New Testament, the good news that our God reigns, that is the good news of the kingdom, the reign of God. So Mark is really drawing, especially in the Old Testament imagery, in the Old Testament, in the context in Isaiah, this is the good news of God restoring his people, bringing his people back to, back to Zion. The, the good news that God is, um, you know, ultimately, it's even a new heaven and a new earth. You know, all these things, they're all wrapped up in Jesus' coming. You know, some of them we won't see until the second coming, but they're introduced at the first coming. And when he says the time is fulfilled, in other words, these prophecies are now coming to pass in the ministry of Jesus. 
Uh, do you want me to talk about Son of God with that also? Absolutely, yeah, yeah. might as well. <laughs> so Son of God in the Old Testament is applied different ways. Sometimes it's applied to angels um, in the plural. Sometimes it's applied to Israel mm. as God's son or, or God's children. But it's also applied to the Davidic dynasty, to the king. So naturally that applies to Jesus as king in the kingdom of God. But in Mark, it, it actually, I think, goes beyond that. I mean, if you have a Gentile audience, they, you know, explaining the Trinity is tricky today, and it would be kind of tricky for them as well. So, you know, in Paul's letters, he, he opens with blessings from the Father and from the Son, so Jesus is clearly divine. But going into the details of explaining, okay, there's only one true God, but that one true God includes the Father and the Son, and then in some parts of the New Testament, and the Spirit, uh, that, that, that might be hard for Gentiles. But talking about God and Son of God, at least you've got Jesus as divine, because Greeks were used to that idea of, of sons of gods that were divine, distinct from the Father, their Father, and so on. Um, obviously, with one true God, and his one son, it's going to mean more than that. But mm. at least at least this gets people in, in sort of the right ballpark. Um, we're going to see, w with the introductions from Isaiah and Malachi, these passages and a number of other passages in the New Testament about Yahweh are specifically applied to Jesus. Mm. And so it's clear for the biblical illiterate that Jesus is Yahweh as well as the Father. But um, son of son of God gets gets close to that, and especially in fourteen thirty six, where he says, "Abba, Father." Y you see, it includes a dimension of intimacy, of of closeness to God, um, and and we also see you know the demons cry out. Sometimes they recognize him as as God's son. Uh, sometimes you know his holiness they're talking about, but also. God the Father, he speaks twice in this gospel. Chapter 1 and verse 11, this is my beloved son in whom I'm well pleased. And again, in chapter 9 and verse 7, he says that. Hmm. And then the next time you hear that declaration, this was God's son, comes with the centurion in 1539 at the foot of the cross, who finally gets it, the crucified one, not the one everybody was expecting, not somebody like the emperor mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, with his kingdom, but the crucified one, the one who doesn't overthrow Roman power but suffers at the hand of Roman power. He's really God's true son, the son of the true God, who is so powerful that he can display his power and weakness and his wisdom and what's foolishness in the eyes of people. So like in the in the intro, we talked about the messianic secret that nobody knows. And then, mm -hmm. so the beginning we have, hey, this is the son of God and no one can figure out, no one can figure out. And it's like his identity is fully revealed at the cross. Yes. And like the centurion who's piercing him goes, I get it. Yeah. Uh, that's pretty cool. Would, would this have been, so he starts off calling him the Jesus Christ, so he's Messiah. At the mm -hmm. very beginning, there's no, there's no confusion mm -hmm. as to the claims that Mark is making. Mm -hmm. And then son of God. Would the phrase son of God been an, an affront to a Greek audience uh, or Roman audience? Would it, would it have been confrontational in any way? Some people have argued that it would be confrontational to the emperor. Um, I don't think that would especially if Mark is writing to Christians in Rome who have just gone through a period of persecution, that probably wouldn't be the most discreet thing to do. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, the, the closest yeah. he comes to confronting a king is the pseudo-king, Herod Antipas, who's really a tetrarch in Mark chapter 6. Uh, but confronting his pretensions would also have implications for the emperor. Uh, and because this is a son of God who's a king, yeah, it does have implications for the emperor. But this is also the gospel where Jesus says in 12, 17, render to Caesar what's Caesar's and to God what's, what's God's. So he's crucified as a, as a would-be king, king of the Jews, but he's not really, it's not a, he's not stooping to challenge Caesar. Caesar's really a non-issue. Jesus has much bigger fish to fry. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so you, in, the, in the beginning intro, this is the beginning of the gospel of Jesus Christ, the Son of God, as is written in the prophet. 
Mm-hmm. Behold, I send a messenger before you. So he's like, hey, this is a story about Jesus, John the Baptist. Like, why is that? Why is John's intro essential for the, the opening Marquean text? So you know who Jesus is. Yeah. Because John, John, well, first of all, he's to prepare the way of the Lord. You have that in both the Malachi and Isaiah texts that are quoted in verses 2 and 3 of the chapter. Jesus is the Lord. John the Baptist says he's going to baptize you in the Holy Spirit. The only one in the Old Testament who can pour out God's Spirit, uh, Isaiah 44, 3, um, Ezekiel 37, Ezekiel 39, uh, Joel chapter 2 in the English version, um, it's just a number of places. The only one who can pour out God's Spirit is God himself. Mm-hmm. So Jesus is divine. And again, where John the Baptist says, I'm not worthy to, to deal with his sandals. Well, normally that was the role of servants. Mm-hmm. Servants would deal with the sandals. John the Baptist is saying, I'm not worthy to be a servant. But in the Old Testament, the prophets were servants of Yahweh. And so John is saying, I'm not even worthy to be the prophet of this one. I'm not worthy to be his servant. He's recognizing that the one whose way is preparing is divine. So people who think, oh, this only comes up in the fourth gospel toward the end of the first century. It's right there from the start. But only for those who are biblically literate enough to hear the New Testament in light of the Old Testament. Speaking of biblical literacy, he says he's quoting Isaiah here. Yes. But... But isn't there like, is it like, is it a mushed quote of two different books, two different quotes yeah. that are kind of put together? Yeah. Uh, Gezerah Shava was a common Jewish interpretive technique where you would link together texts based on a common key word or phrase. Mm. So you see how these fit together. And actually the Malachi quote, he actually mushes in a little bit of wording from, uh, I think it's Exodus 23 as well. But, um, but in doing that, Mark often sandwiches things so he'll have um he'll be discussing one topic or one one event normally he'll come back to that event and in between he'll do something else he'll like have a flashback hmm. or the you know the events will be combined or uh he he, he leaves off something he's going to come back to it the next day and in the meantime something else happens it is it it, it functions interpretively uh, shedding light on the context so he he mentions isaiah He's going to quote Isaiah. In between, he quotes Malachi. So in Malachi, the context, you have Elijah, uh, actually in the next chapter in the English version, Elijah comes and prepares the way for for Yahweh. Mm -hmm. So the one who's preparing the way seems to be uh, this Elijah. And John the Baptist, the way he's dressed in verse 6 is the way Elijah was dressed in 2 Kings 1.8, you know, with the, the camel's hair and stuff. And so, um, or the leather girdle. And so, you know, John is functioning as Elijah, but that obviously means the one whose way is preparing is Yahweh. I mean, it's so obvious if you're mm-hmm. biblically literate um, in terms of the, knowing the Old Testament, as, as Mark would have expected as, well, the heart of his target audience to, to be. I think he welcomed everybody. But also um, uh, in, in Malachi, it talks about the, the Lord coming and cl- cleansing his temple, purifying his temple. So already pointing towards chapter 11. And then, the, for, for the, again, for those who knew the context. And Isaiah 40 sets up for a new exodus or a new deliverance where God would, would deliver his people. He would bring them back to the land. And, of course, you have uh, Jesus later in the gospel saying, I'm going to go before you to Galilee and, you know, my sheep have been scattered, but he's going to regather them. And then the ultimate gathering is in chapter 30, chapter 13, around verses 26 and 27, where he'll gather together his, his chosen ones from one end of the heaven to the other, you know, from you know, all, all of creation. Uh, but, but it's beginning already. The, this uh, work is already beginning in Jesus' ministry. So uh, with Isaiah, he frames these Isaiah themes that will be highlighted in his in his gospel. So we see kind of a progression here of him uh, going to John the Baptist, John the Baptist preparing the way. Jesus comes to John the Baptist, gets baptized. Then we have this sort of uh, angelic 
well, God voice come from the heavens and then the the spirit descend on Jesus. All of these are sending an intentional message. Mm. What is the message Mark is trying to make here? Mm. It's it's beautiful. Uh, J- Jesus is identifying with his people, with Israel. Uh, so we haven't been presented as divine, but he's also presented as, as human, identifying with his people, being tempted in the wilderness and so on. And and when the, the spirit comes down on him, uh, in the form of a dove that's probably evoking the new creation because remember the dove uh, with uh, Noah. Noah, yeah, and Genesis 8, but then also the uh, the heavenly voice, and uh, some later rabbis spoke of that as the, the bat kol, uh, heavenly voice for when the spirit of prophecy would be quenched, at least you could hear this voice from heaven, but Obviously, the spirit of prophecy with John the Baptist is bearing witness to Jesus, too. But this this voice from heaven, uh, like you have when uh, Abraham offers his son Isaac, his beloved son. Um, so you, you may have an allusion to Genesis 22, verse 2. You also have, uh, most scholars think, especially an allusion to Psalm 2, verse 7, um, where... God declares of the of the ultimate Davidic king, uh, you are my son. So this is my beloved son, uh, or you're my beloved son, in you I'm well pleased. There's an echo there of Isaiah 42, hmm. where you have the servant of, of Yahweh, and the spirit of the Lord comes on him, just like mm-hmm. there, and God is well pleased with him. So you have these different echoes being blended. Uh, God speaks in the language of Scripture. Is that surprising? <laughs> so he's using, a, he's unpacking a whole lot of uh, typological allusions here, right? Yeah. I mean, okay. Just, yeah. The, the the language of even the Spirit coming upon him and driving him into the wilderness. Because oh, after yeah. the baptism, the Spirit comes on and drives him into the wilderness. Now that language. And I think I got this from one of your videos, so I'm, I'm gonna I'm gonna pretend like I don't know <laughs> You're Greek. Setting him up I'm setting him up to answer his, his <laughs> yeah. question, but I'm pretty sure that language is like Jesus casting out demons, driving them out, like the same. That's strong language. Yeah, yeah. There's irony in that, but keep in mind, Mark. Yeah, you know, I mean Luke. In Luke Acts, he mentions the Spirit like sixty times. Mm-hmm. Mark mentions the Spirit six times, the Spirit mm. of God, and three of them are up front in the introduction where he has all this stuff compactly. Oh, wow. So Jesus is the one who will baptize in the Spirit. At his baptism, the Spirit comes on Jesus. So Jesus is not only the Spirit baptizer, he's the model for the Spirit-baptized life. Well, how does that model work out? The Spirit then drives him into the wilderness for conflict with Satan, mm. which is going to set the tone for the rest of the Gospel. I mean... Jesus' yeah. conflict with Satan all throughout. With the yeah. Pharisees and- I mean, I mean next, next place he comes, he's, he's got... He confronts a demon Mm -hmm. in the house of worship. Uh, Chapter 3, they're accusing him of serving Satan. He's like, "Uh, you guys have it backwards here, (laughs) and and, and so on. But uh, driving him into the wilderness, here's the model for the Spirit-baptized life. We will just have everything be happy and no no hardship. No, the Spirit drives us into conflict because we are now God's agents in this world, empowered— we're supposed to follow Jesus' example, um, like doing the doing the miracles, like he sent his disciples to do, and suffering, going to the cross, taking up our cross, and following him. Uh, all all of that is is implicit already here in the beginning. And the wilderness fits you know, the voice of one crying in the wilderness. John's there. Well, now Jesus is there. Um, geographically, it fits for the you know the southern Jordan re- region near the. Near the Dead Sea, it was pretty barren. Not all the wilderness of Judea is as barren as that, but that one's pretty barren. But anyway. Well, so, uh, hold on, because I've got a. Th- this is an important point, especially in our culture today, where uh, becoming a Christian means you, you feel like you've suddenly entered into a uh, perfect life, we're problem-free. Mm-hmm. And, and if anything, if Jesus is baptized in the Spirit, it means just the opposite. He's going right into the problems, right into the, the storm. Uh, not absent from it. Um, yeah. That's, I mean, that's a key thing there. But he's got, he's got God with him all the way. Yes, uh, and it'll serve as a, as a sort of a foreshadowing of everything that's coming. Yeah, okay. and, a, and a template for for us. Yeah, the wilderness. Hey, no place to plug in your iPhone in the wilderness. <laughs> I heard that. <laughs>
So we, we've, we've hit on some themes already in this book. We've talked about them at the beginning of our intro, and we're going to look for those themes throughout the book. You know, we talked about the Son of God narrative. We saw that. Well, you just mentioned, again, another one, which is we share in his sufferings. We share in his power. Now, the next one, the next scene, he comes out of the wilderness. The very next thing he does is starts picking disciples. And that's one of our themes is discipleship. Mm-hmm. So, so again, why is this significant in I mean, the life of a baptized believer is one suffers in power or suffers with Christ, demonstrates power with Christ, but it's also a life of discipleship. So you want to speak into that for us? He preaches alongside it. He preaches the gospel. That's right. Verses 14 to 15 before we come to 16 to 20. Oh, man, you've got the verses memorized? Jeez, Louise. I'm I'm so outmatched here. It's not even right. (laughs) Would you like to ask the questions and answer them? This is is so... (laughs) It's just because I'm working closely with the text. Oh, praise God. Of course. I I don't want to shame you at all for knowing the Bible. But that does go hand in hand, right? He's preaching the gospel Mm -hmm. and he's... Mm-hmm. Uh, bringing disciples in, and that, he, that has to go hand in hand. Yeah, yeah. He preaches the kingdom, and then we have it, it exemplified by disciples mm. forsaking everything to follow him, except we find out later it wasn't quite everything. Picking up the cross, going to the cross with him, that was like... <laughs> they didn't see that. They didn't see that one. Yeah. Even though he warned them, but they, in, even though they said they were ready. So we need to... We need to make sure we're ready, and, and we do that by um, by sacrificing whatever we need to sacrifice in the way and passing whatever tests we need to pass in the way and recognizing that the one we're following, yeah, he has all power, but he also, in this world where people are given the choice, in a sense, I mean, the demons don't have a choice. Come out. They have to come out. But the people... You know, storms are stilled. The storms obey him. The demons obey him. A, 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 an unbroken cult where you have to break it. You have to spend months teaching it, you know, how to, before you can ride it very far. Jesus rides like a mile on this cult. The cult submits to him. It's just people who have the choice. And they don't always make the choice the right way in Mark's gospel when, or in most of life today. <laughs> and it is interesting because I feel like in making disciples, I want to let people know on the very front end what they're signing up for. Yeah. yeah. But it doesn't sound like he does that with the disciples here, right? He kind of calls them. Uh, maybe I'm wrong about that. Is there indication, at least in, in the beginning of the gospel, where he does that? Uh, maybe not. Maybe not in Mark's gospel. I mean, again, from the other gospels, we know Jesus talked about it a lot. And Jesus does talk about it in Mark's gospel. First, they have to get that he's the Christ. Then he starts in right away with the passion predictions, yeah. telling them he's going to the cross. So, uh, the first half of the gospel, they they have to find out who he is. Second half of the gospel, they have to find out what that means that mm-hmm. he's the crucified Messiah. But and therefore, what it means to be a disciple as well. Yes, yeah, but but they do give up something to follow him. Mm-hmm. I mean, uh, fishing like. They probably spend a lot of time around Tabga, which is near Capernaum. Uh, and then certain times of the year, they would fish in some other areas of the lake. But, you know, just to leave your, your profession and leave behind your family, in, in Peter's case, um, and, and J- James, James and John well. are leaving behind their, their, their father, uh, Zebedee, in the boat, uh, and apparently a fairly lucrative business because they have hired workers there. That's a significant thing. And it probably echoes Elijah calling Elisha. And Elisha drops everything to follow him, but says, first, let me go say farewell to my family. And he throws a farewell party for himself. And we have that uh, illusion developed further in Matthew 8 and Luke 9. But um, Mark, Mark doesn't recount that story, but does recount count the disciples being willing to follow at least this much. And Greeks also had stories of people who were willing to drop everything and follow a, a radical teacher. You know, most, most Jewish teachers wait for a, somebody to pick them out. You know, it's like I, 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 I would probably get in trouble if I went through the registration line here and said, don't take that teacher. No, no, take me. <laughs> but I mean, Jesus calls his own disciples like Elijah did, and they respond in a radical way. But as we'll see, they're not quite radical enough yet. You probably wouldn't get in trouble. The registrar would be like, yeah, you really should take Keener. <laughs> <laughs> <No. laughs> uh, so he, he 
goes the very first like miracle story you read about in Mark is the driving out the demon, mm -hmm. right? So you, he gets driven into the wilderness, and now he's oh. driving out a spirit. I never. You're right. I, I I never I never answered that that one question. It's the word it's the word ekbalo, and it is used for different things. Uh, but in in Mark's gospel, at least half the time I think it's used for casting out demons so the spirit comes on jesus mm -hmm. and he's empowered now to cast out demons but the spirit casts jesus out into the wilderness for conflict with the chief of the demons mm -hmm. so there's this irony you know it costs jesus something to mm. have this power you think the overcoming of satan in the wilderness is part of the overcoming and driving out demons that he does afterwards mm, i think so certainly now there's different different views on what the binding is in 327 scholars uh -huh. are roughly divided maybe in half i haven't completely decided yet but uh it is interesting a lot a lot of scholars think that jesus bound the strong man by defeating him at the at the temptation mm. and that's why he's as opposed to the cross well he's already casting out the demons True. so yeah the i mean i guess the ultimate binding would be the cross mm -hmm. but um so we've only um, we're, we're going to get real close up onto our time, if not just a minute or okay. two over. But but it would be wrong not to talk about the kingdom. So Jesus went and preached the kingdom after he comes out of the wilderness. What what is the message of the kingdom? If he's the king, right? When, what's the message of the kingdom? Well, I remember thinking as a new Christian, I would read this and I would think. So he went around telling people he was going to die on a cross and be yeah. raised from the dead. Like I didn't get what that meant. Because yeah. that was the good news I was preached when I became a Christian. Mm. So what does that mean for him to be preaching on the kingdom, the good news about the kingdom? The good news of the promised restoration, like in the book of Isaiah, that God reigns and he reigns evidently. It's it's being being demonstrated. When Jesus is healing the sick and driving out demons, he's he's demonstrating his authority over over nature and everything else but people still have a choice until the you know until the final the final day the day of judgment um and so he's king but how the kingship works with the cross n what people weren't expecting him to come in two two stages first coming and second coming mm -hmm. so what second say this is a new teaching like they don't they don't yeah. You know what it is. Yeah, they don't understand. Um, they, yeah, not just that Jesus reigns, but they say, verse 21, they're, they're impressed with, with this teaching. But then in, I think it's verse 28, maybe it's 27, but I think it's around verse 28, where he says that it's, uh, they say it's a, it's a new teaching with authority in light of him casting out the demon in the synagogue and, and just with a word, not using all the, kind of magical techniques that people sometimes use to try to get demons out. Yeah, that's powerful. Well, uh, we, we definitely come to the close of this. There's a couple of portions there in uh, in, in Mark we won't yeah, be able yeah. to touch there in that uh, chapter. Do you, do you have a, a, a segment that you want to try to touch on? I mean, we've got two more minutes, three more minutes. Okay. We could we could sneak one in. Thanks. Yeah, yeah absolutely. Je Jesus heals a lot of people. Yeah, he does. Uh, starting with, with Simon's mother-in-law. Um, and then she gets up and serves them in that language of, Diakoneo becomes a model because it, later you have the women doing that in 15, mm -hmm. 40, and 41. But you have the disciples not wanting to do that in 10, uh, mm. 43 mm. to 45. Jesus has to say, you know, because they're saying, who's who's the greatest? Uh, James and John both want to be uh, beside him. And, and Jesus says, um, the Son of Man came to serve. And, uh, and then also with the leper, uh, verses 40 to 45 he touches he touches uh, Simon's mother-in-law but she wasn't necessarily ritually impure but a leper was ritually impure supposed to stand like 50 paces away according to tradition and according to Leviticus 13 is supposed to be calling out unclean unclean he's close enough so he's probably he's probably you know getting in Jesus face anyway for Jesus to be able to touch him but um, Jesus stretches out his hand and touches him. That's going to come up in the in the narratives later because Jesus is going to get on people's nerves in terms of the purity mm -hmm. regulations. Uh, not all of them from the Torah itself, a lot of them from tradition. But there's some things that are more important than, than their traditions uh, that have been highlighted since like the 2nd century BC. And in terms of uh, the Torah, Jesus doesn't actually contract ritual impurity by touching the man. Instead, 
the influence goes the other way. Jesus has the Holy Spirit, therefore he can cast out the impure spirits and he can heal the impure from their impurities. And, and the language there in that one, that specific text, and again, I don't remember where I heard this from. I don't read Greek or Hebrew, so I, don't, I, can't, I can't speak authoritatively to any of this, but um, you have Jesus, he sees, he is moved to compassion, pity on the man, and then it says, and I'll, you, again, you're uh, going to correct there's me. A, there's a textual variant there. But. Okay, okay. And, but then it does seem as if Mark wants us to know that he touched him yes. before he said, be clean. Mm -hmm. like, it, like it was important that Mark's like his, his uncleanliness wasn't going to rub off on Jesus. It's like he wanted mm -hmm. the, the reader to know. There with Jesus, mm -hmm. it gets reversed. And everybody, everybody that Jesus heals, except for the woman who reaches out and touches him mm -hmm. in, in, in chapter 5, everybody Jesus heals, he either touches them or commands them to be healed or give, gives them some sort of command or both. Mm -hmm. um, so there's, uh, there's some patterns there as well. That's great. Excellent. Well, uh, is as, as far as far as leprosy, um, Hansen's disease would have been considered a form of leprosy, a very severe form. But it didn't. Leprosy didn't necessarily mean that. Right. Um, leprosy could be a eczema. severe case of eczema. Sure. Uh, I have a mild case of eczema. If you can zero in with the camera, you can maybe see it under my. We'll get that in the blooper reel. Eye. Yeah, in the blooper <laughs> reel. Yeah. So, but yeah. Excellent. Cool. Well, guys, thank you so much for tuning in to this episode. We're continuing on this series on the Gospel of Mark. Uh, stay tuned for next week where we release another episode. And thank you guys so much for your time. And Dr. Keener, thank you for spending time with us up here at Asbury. I appreciate thank, it. Thanks so much for being with me. Yeah. I hope you've enjoyed that episode on the Gospel of Mark with Dr. Craig Keener. If you want to go back and watch former episodes that we've done, there's a playlist right here, uh, or you can watch the very next chapter, which will be listed right here. If you've been blessed by this episode or other episodes we've done, consider giving. There are links in the description. <laughs>